Do you have traditions in your family? I think we all have traditions. This time of year, do you have traditions this time of year in your family? For the last 16, 17, 18 years in our family, it has been a tradition in our family to make chocolate chip cookies on New Year or not New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve, to make chocolate chip cookies. Now, what better way is there to celebrate Christmas than to have fresh baked chocolate chip cookies? When Santa Claus comes to our house, he likes fresh, out of the oven, baked from scratch chocolate chip cookies. That's what he likes when he comes to our house. So that's what he gets when he comes. That's our tradition. And so we found a recipe several years ago. It's called the, and you're not designed, this is not intended for you to be able to read everything, but this is just what the recipe looks like on the recipe site. On food.com, this is what it looks like. Uh, but it's called the world's best chocolate chip cookies, and they are. All right? If it, I'm not inviting you to my house on Christmas Eve to partake of these because there's not enough for you and Santa Claus, and Santa Claus is the guy who's going to get more cookies than you on Christmas Eve. But they are the world's best chocolate chip cookies. And uh, it, it's, it's an incredible recipe, but I'm not here to talk to you about Christmas Eve. I'm not here to talk about chocolate chip cookies. But I want to use this as a springboard for us this morning to focus in on some very important things. I want us to think this morning about how do you make chocolate chip cookies? That's, that's an important life task. Okay, folks, young people, that is an important life task to learn. If you graduate from high school, that's great, but you need to know how to bake chocolate chip cookies. That, that is a life-saving skill. But how do you do it? Let me suggest to you that there are two main things that you've got to be able to do if you're going to make chocolate chip cookies. First thing that you're going to have to do in order to make chocolate chip cookies is you are going to have, you are going to, have to gather together all of the relevant information that you are going to need to make those cookies. Doesn't that make sense? If you're going to make cookies, wouldn't it help to know what you're going to need in order to make those cookies? So what kind of information? What kind of information are you going to need in order to make these chocolate chip cookies? Well, you're going to have to have all of the relevant ingredients in order to make chocolate chip cookies. Wouldn't that be good? With not just ingredients. Notice the word relevant. You, you're not going to your cupboard and just pulling out all ingredients, are you? You are pulling out all of the relevant ingredients in order to make chocolate chip cookies. So, you got to have sugar, right? Are you gonna Are you gonna make chocolate chip cookies without your sugar? You got to have your sugar. That's that's got to go in your bowl. I got to get my list here so I can go in order. You got to have your brown sugar. We don't just want the white sugar. We want the brown sugar. So that's got to go in your. Can, can you make chocolate chip cookies without the brown sugar? They're going to look kind of funny, but I wouldn't recommend it. So you got to have your brown sugar in order to make it. you got to have a cup of butter. Somewhere in here I've got more than a cup of butter because we like butter in our cookies. So you've got to have your butter, and you've got to measure that out so you can have the right amount of cookies uh, uh, of cookies and butter. you got to have your vanilla. Can you, can you make cookies without vanilla? They're, they're going to taste kind of weird, but you can do that if you want. you got to have a couple eggs, all right? You gotta have a couple eggs in order to make. And so you got, you got. So you gotta have a big bowl, all right. You gotta have a big bowl in order to do this. Where are we? We got vanilla. We got eggs. You gotta have your all-purpose flour. All, now notice that you gotta have. Sugar is more important than flour when you make cookies. So you, you you gotta have the right proportions when you're doing that. Where are we? You gotta have your baking soda. Can you do? Can you make cookies without your baking soda? Well, we're not recommended. Did I remember the salt? Yep. You got to have salt, and you got to have a good. You got to have a good amount of salt. You don't want to run out of salt when you're making your cookies. Now, can you make chocolate chip cookies without chocolate chips? No, not going to work. So when you're gathering together, how am I going to make chocolate chip cookies? You've got to gather together all of the relevant information, which includes all of the relevant ingredients. What do I need to make them? I got to have these ingredients and no more and no less than what's listed. Now, sugar is important for Chuck. Can, what, how, now, how much this recipe only calls for three quarter cup 
of sugar. Can you imagine? You're going to make cookies. they got to be sweet. And you can only put three quarters of this cup of this sugar to make the cookies. What if you decided, forget that little cup, I'm going to use three quarters of this cup. you got to have sugar in order to make chocolate chip cookies. So I'm going to, forget this little dude, I'm going to make three quarters of this thing. Is that going to work? How are those cookies, oh boy, how are those cookies going to turn out? Well, you're supposed to have three cups of this stuff. What if you decide, well, I'm going to make chocolate chip cookies, but, you know, I'm going to make healthy chocolate chip cookies, so I'm, I'm, I'm only going to put a tablespoon of, 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 of chocolate chips in there. Uh, how's that going to turn out? Lousy. One person's going to have chocolate chips in their cookies, and the rest are going to have nothing. That's not chocolate chip cookies. So you've got to have relevant, and you've got to have all the relevant ingredients. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Don't change it. If, if instead at the store, instead of getting your semi-sweet chocolate chip cookies, what if you accidentally picked up a bag of the peanut butter chips instead of these? And you put those in the cookies instead of these. Well, those would still be good cookies, but guess what they would not be? They're not chocolate chip cookies. What's our goal today? Our goal today is to make chocolate chip cookies. We've got to gather together all of the relevant information, which includes all of the relevant ingredients, and to do so at the proper level. If I don't do that, they're not chocolate chip cookies. There's something else. There's something else I've created, maybe, but they're not chocolate chip cookies. So I gather all of the relevant ingredients. Am I done making chocolate chip cookies yet? I've got all my ingredients. Am I done? Mm, looks, no, it doesn't look done. It's not looking very good in there. What, do you gotta, what else you got to do? Not only do you need all the relevant or ingredients, you need all of the relevant instructions. Now that I have my ingredients, what do I do? Now that I have everything out of the cupboards and out of the refrigerator, what do I do with this information? And as I go through this, I've got to make sure that I'm following the instructions as they are laid out here can you make chocolate chip cookies without following some sort of instruction list? It's going to be a little hard. Number one thing I've got to do in order to make chocolate chip cookies the right way, I've got to gather all of the relevant information. Once I've gathered all of that relevant information, including the ingredients and the information, here's the second thing I have to do. Once I've gathered everything together, I've got my ingredients, I've got my instructions, now what? I have to handle that information correctly. Not enough that I've just got the ingredients. Not enough that I've just got the instructions. I have to handle that correctly. What, what, is, what does that mean? What's, what's involved in that? Number one, what's involved in that is that and when I come to this, I only need to draw conclusions based upon complete information. Suppose I, I, I mix all of this up, and then, I, and, and then I go back and I look and I say, wow, well, I, 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 don't see, I don't see where it says to put them in the oven. I don't even see where it says what temperature, because I'm not reading this very well. I don't see what temperature, I, it doesn't even say put them in the oven. I guess these are easy no-bake cookies. So I've, I've made them all up, and so now I'm going to serve them to my guests as easy no-bake cookies. How's that going to turn out? Uh, there can be some sick people around, right? That doesn't work. So I have to only draw conclusions when I have all of the information. And all of the information includes, David, you've got to put these in the oven and you've got to bake them. But if I skip that part of it, I'm not making chocolate chip cookies the way they're designed to be made. Number two on this idea of, of handling this correctly is I've got to let the information explain itself. If I, are chocolate chip cookies hard to make? I mean, honestly. I, I don't know if I've ever made them personally in my life. But are they that? I shouldn't have admitted that. Should, is, are they very hard to make? If you follow the instructions. Let the instructions explain themselves. Read over them and, and try to understand them. Follow the directions as they are written there. Don't, don't try to make stuff up as you go. And do it in order. What's going to happen if the very first thing I do when I get ready to make chocolate chip cookies, I break this bag open and I dump it in the bowl? Is that, is that in order? No, that's down like what, number six or five or four or somewhere. There's steps before that. And if I try to skip steps in order, because I want my chocolate chip, if I try to skip steps, what am I doing? I'm failing at making chocolate chip cookies. I might end up with something else, 
but it's not going to be chocolate chip cookies. I've got to gather all of the relevant information, then I've got to handle it correctly, which involves not changing anything. David, don't add to what this says. Well, you know, it says bake them 10 to 12 minutes, which means if they're good at 10 to 12, they ought to be really good at 45 minutes because they'll just be extra good, right? David, don't add, don't add to the information that's given to you here. Leave it alone. Well, what, what, if, what, if, what if I just change it up? What, what if, what if I, what if I uh, put those, those peanut butter chips in there in, instead of the chocolate? Well, David, that's fine, but you can't at the end say you've made chocolate chip cookies. Don't change anything that the instructions say to do. Don't substitute anything. You know, I, I, I like Reese's peanut butter cups. They're pretty good. But if I take Reese's peanut butter cups and slide them into this recipe, have I made the world's best chocolate chip cookies? I've improved them. I've made them even better. But they're not the world's best chocolate chip cookies. That's not the way that it works. I don't have a right to change it and then at the end say that I've done what it said to do. What's involved in this? Keep it in context. You think, what in the world? What does context have to do with baking? Let me explain to you what context has to do with baking. On the list of ingredients, it says that I need three-quarter tablespoon of baking soda. You know what kind of soda we use in our house to bake? The kind of soda we use in our house to bake is this kind of soda right here. So, suppose I get the idea that I'm just going to... Does context have anything to do? I mean, you got to have a brain that says baking soda, but is what about using... I mean, that's soda, right? In context, that's not baking soda. In the context, you know what baking soda is. Well, in the context, it says what? I've got to have vanilla, a tablespoon of vanilla. Well, this is the kind of vanilla that I like, so how about a <laughs> tablespoon of that vanilla? And forget the tablespoon of that vanilla. I'm going to put a whole stinking cup of that vanilla in this recipe. How's that going to turn out? In the context, what kind of vanilla is this talking about? When I get over here to number five on the, on the steps and it says stir in chips, if I haven't been paying attention, I'm just going to stir in some chips then. There you go. Stir those puppies in. In the context, what are chips? The recipe tells us what the chips are, but I've got to pay attention to the context. Otherwise, what do I do? I mess it up, and I get it all wrong. If I don't pay attention to the instructions, if I don't pay attention to the context, and the final thing on here is I need to look at the overall thing and say, is, what is the one determined purpose here? What am I trying to make? Chocolate chip cookies. How are potato chips going to help me to do that? Eh, they're they're, they're going to make it crunchy maybe, but that's not according to the recipe. I need to find what is the one intended meaning and purpose and outcome from this. If I change one thing, the ingredients, the information, or the instructions, if I change one thing, it's not chocolate, the world's best chocolate chip cookies anymore. It's mine. It's my recipe. It might be something that I like, but it's not according to the instructions. Does this have any application to us? Can you see in any way how this might have some application to us today? I want you to think today about how do you interpret the Bible. And I want you to think today that interpreting the Bible takes common sense. Does making chocolate chip cookies, does that take common sense? Yeah, it's not that hard. Just use the brain that God gave you and use the common sense that God gave you and you can make chocolate chips. What about the Bible? People have told you the Bible is hard to understand. Nobody can understand that thing. It's just so complicated. You know, if you believe one thing and I believe something else, that's no big deal because it's a hard book to understand. If you believe one thing about baking soda and I believe something else, is that okay? If you believe one thing about chips that belong in, in, in cookies and somebody else believes something else about chips that belong in cookies, is that okay? Well, you might say, well, it really doesn't matter. But what about when it comes to the Bible? Does it matter if we get it right? Does it matter if we get it right? Does God expect us 
to get it right. God gave us the Bible. God gave us a brain. Do you think that He can make the two things work together so that one can understand the other? How do I interpret the Bible? Folks, it just takes common sense. I want to I, I use what we have talked about this morning and, and use that as, as a way to... Don't, don't let this bother you. Use that in a way to say, how do we apply that to biblical instruction? How do we take what we've just talked about that's just so simple and see that actually every principle that I've put up here in making chocolate chip cookies is actually principles of interpreting the Bible. I just made them fit chocolate chip cookies because I like chocolate chip cookies. But their interpretation, their interpreting principles that fit, how do you understand what the Bible has to say? I want to talk for just a minute about what does the Bible have to say about the organization of the church? Does the Bible have anything to say about the organization of the church and how God wants His church to be organized? Does it say just one or two things about that? What do we need to do? Well, if we're going to understand what the Bible says about the organization of the church, we've got to gather all of the relevant information. Where do we go for that? We go to the Bible, right? What, do I need to know what the Bible says about the organization of the church? How am I going to figure out what the Bible says about the organization of the church? i got to get to the Bible and gather how, how much of the evidence, how much information should I gather, just as much as I want, just as much as what I think is good enough? What's the word? I've got to gather all of the... That's going to take a little while. I've got to gather all the relevant information and say, what does the Bible say about the organization of the church? The Bible says in the organization of the church that Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 5 and verse 23, Christ is the head of the church. I've got to put that in my bowl because that's what the Bible says about the organization of the church. The Bible says about the organization of the church that every instruction that is given regarding how the church is to be organized was only to local congregations. God never gave instructions for, for higher groups or a hierarchy to have, have organization over the church. He only gave instructions to a local congregation every time. That's what he gave. I need to put that in my bowl and remember that, that that's a key ingredient. The Bible says when it comes to the organization of the church that is to be overseen by elders. The Bible says in Acts 20 and verse 28 that uh, Paul was talking to those elders that the Holy Spirit had made them overseers over the church. So the church is to have those elders who will oversee the flock and oversee the work of the church. That's what the Bible says about the organ. I, I've got to put that. I've got to put that in my bowl too. That's an important. That's an important ingredient to have. The Bible says that these elders are also called bishops. So when I'm reading the Bible. And I see the word bishop, I know it's about an elder. When I'm reading the Bible and it says they're uh, talking about pastors, I know it's talking about elders because the Bible uses all of those words interchangeably. That's an important thing to have in my bowl too, to understand an important ingredient about the organization of the church. The Bible says, when I'm gathering all of this information, the Bible says that an eldership only has authority among the congregation where they are. And the word among is in Acts 20 and verse 28 and 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. So they don't have authority outside of that congregation, just among that congregation. It's the only place an eldership has an authority. Is that an important ingredient for us to know? But I'm going to put that in my bowl too. What else does the Bible say? The Bible says that when it comes to those elders serving in the church, that there was always to be a plurality of men, not just one man, who, who, who was the elder, the bishop, the pastor over the church, but it was always a plurality of men who were appointed in that position. Acts 14 and verse 23, Paul appointed elders in every church, plural. That's an important element to have in my bowl as I'm trying to understand what the Bible says. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that the elders were always men. That's one of the qualifications, is that only those who were males were permitted to serve as elders, but not just those who were males, but those who were scripturally married. They were to be the husband of one wife. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 says, so they, that's, that's, that's an important ingredient to understand, but not only just somebody who's married. Titus chapter 1 and verse 6 says that they were to have faithful children. So as I'm pulling together information, and I'm just, all I'm doing is gathering the ingredients. I'm gathering the information. 
I understand that those aren't just the only qualifications. They've got to fulfill all of the qualifications that are in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. What am I doing? I'm trying to understand what does the Bible say about organization of the church? What am I doing? I'm doing the same thing I do when I bake chocolate chip cookies. I'm just gathering all of the relevant information. I'm going to the source to get every piece of information that I can. But it's not just elders who are part of the church. The Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 3 says that the church was to be served by deacons. And so I, I need to understand that there's those elders and they have a specific responsibility and there are deacons and those deacons are special servants. Those special servants have specified duties and responsibilities in the church. So I say, okay, that's important because elders and deacons are two different individuals, two different roles in the church, fulfilling two different tasks. That's important for me to know. I'm going to put that in my bowl of information. We find out that deacons, just like elders, deacons are only deacons and only work among the congregation where those deacons are. So in other words, a deacon doesn't just go from one church and go to another church and say, hey, I'm deacon so-and-so, and, I, and, and I, need you to, I need you to recognize me as deacon. He's, he's not deacon so-and-so of that other congregation. He's just a visitor. Amen. He's only a deacon where he has been appointed a deacon among that. That's what Acts chapter 6 indicates to us. The Bible also says that deacons were also men. It's one of the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And just like the elders, they are to be scripturally married. They're the husband of one wife, and they are not just married. They're not newlyweds. They're individuals who are leading their home, that they rule their own house well. First Timothy chapter 3 says about these men, and they rule their children well. So they have children. They have uh, children who are uh, under their control, and those aren't the only qualifications. These men are to fulfill all of the qualifications that are found in First Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Is that important to know? It's in the Bible. It's in my list of ingredients and information. So as I'm just trying to gather information, what does the Bible say about organization of the church? I'm going to put that in my bowl. That's important to know. The Bible says that, that a church, that a congregation needs uh, evangelists to be able to preach the gospel to them. Well, that's important. I'm going to put that in my bowl. The Bible says that, that a church is made up of, not, church isn't just made up of elders and deacons and preachers. What a what a sorry church that would be if it only had elders, deacons, and preachers. Huh? That's what you might think. So that the Bible says that a congregation, the church is made up of active, faithful members in that congregation. So there's active, faithful members. Some of those active, faithful members are the elders and the deacons and the preachers. But that's what, that's what a congregation is. It's made up of those individuals who are part of the church. They, they have been baptized into the Lord's body. They have become a part of a local congregation. They're actively serving in that body of people in that congregation. So that's a piece of information. I put that in my bowl. What have I been trying to do? I've been trying to figure out what does the Bible say about the organization of the church? And I've gathered all of my relevant information and I've put it into my bowl. And as I look down in my bowl, the next thing I've got to do is I've got my information. Now what? I've got to handle it correctly. I've got to make sure that I don't start pulling stuff out and using it in a way that is not right. Well, do you recognize any of these points? Everything we said about making chocolate chip cookies and handling that information correctly is the same thing I've got to do in handling information about the organization of the church correctly. I cannot draw any conclusions about the organization of the church that the evidence does not demand. I've got to look at my bowl. I can't draw a conclusion if it's not validated by what is in my bowl. If I don't have the information, if it's not here before, I can't draw a conclusion that's not here, that's not substantiated by the evidence. And so I've got to come and let the evidence do the teaching, not me. I don't come to the evidence and say, evidence, I want you to say this. Uh-uh, that's backwards. I come to the evidence, I say, evidence, information, tell me what I need to know. I don't come to the Bible and tell the Bible what I want it to say. I come to the Bible and I let the Bible tell me what I need to do. I need to follow the directions that God gives. I need to proceed in the order that God has outlined in His Word, and I have no right to change what God says. No matter how appealing it might be, no matter what other groups might be doing, I have no right to change what's in the bowl of information that God has given to us. And I've got to keep every bit of it in the context that God designed for it to have. And when I'm gathering that information, I need to understand that God only has one meaning that he intends for his word to have. He doesn't have multiple meanings. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, the Bible says that we are to speak the same thing. That means we're to have the same understanding, same mind, same judgment. 
God has one understanding for us to have. I come to this bowl. It's not, well, it doesn't matter what it says. It matters what it says because this is the Word of God. I gather all of the relevant information and then I handle it correctly. And so when I come to this bowl and I look in this bowl, guess what I don't see in this bowl? When I've gathered all of my information about the organization of the church and when I've handled it accurately, and, the way, and, and by the way, this handling accurately, that's what was read in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling a right, the old American standard said. Handling a right. I think the new, new American standard says handling accurately the word of truth. That's our responsibility is to handle this accurately. And when I've done that and I look in my bowl of information, guess what I don't see here? I don't see a pope inside this bowl. It's, it's, not, it's not in the Bible. I, I don't say that to be mean. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you what I see in the bowl of information that God has given to us. I, I don't see a one-man pastor leading a church. That, that, that's, that's not in the bowl of information that God has given. And, and, and I gather this all together, and I look at it, and I, I, I don't see women serving as elders or as deacons because that's not what's in the bowl. I don't see single men serving as elders or single men serving as pastors or as deacons because that's, that's not what's in the information that God has given to me. I don't see one man having authority in another congregation that he's not among. I don't see one man going to another congregation, all of a sudden he's a bishop over that congregation too, because that's not in this bowl. And when I look in this bowl, I don't see Christians who are not a part of a congregation. Because when I look in this bowl, there's no such thing as a Christian who is a Christian at large, a Christian who's not affiliated with a congregation, a Christian who's not a member of the church. He's just a Christian out there, but he's not a part of it because that's not in the bowl of information that I've gathered together. Do you understand how to interpret the Bible? To interpret the Bible, we've got to gather everything the Bible says about it. We've got to handle it accurately, and handle it accurately means I don't change what God says. And that's what Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19 teaches us. Can we look real quick? Can we look real quick? If you allow me? Does the Bible have anything to say about worship? Does the Bible have anything to say about worship? If I want to worship God, is that a good thing? Is that a good idea? I wake up on a Sunday morning and say, I, I want to worship God. How would I know how to do that? Would I just make it up on my own? Would I just make it up as I go? Whatever feels right, whatever feels good, that's what I'll do. If I want to know what the Bible says, if I want to interpret the Bible, it's just going to take some common sense. And just as we've done before, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to gather all of the relevant information, all of the relevant evidence, the, the, the information, the instructions God gives says, what does the Bible say about, about worship? Well, the Bible says that our worship is to be directed to God. Matthew 4 and verse 10. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He is the true audience of worship. Which means that's not me. That's good information for me to have. Our worship has got to be directed towards God. But it also has to come from my heart. It's not just some mechanical thing that I go through. It's, it's, got, to ha I've got, to, it's got to have meaning in my heart. It's, it's got to come from my heart. I've got to mean the words that come from my, from my mouth when I'm worshiping God. That's John chapter 4 and verse 24. That's good information for me to have. That same verse also says that worship is to be done in truth, which means that there's a standard. It, it, it means that there is a law by which God wants me to follow. So I don't make it up as I go. I find out what does God want me to do, and, and I follow His truth. Colossians 3 and verse 17 says, Whatever you do, that would include worship, in word or deed, do all in the name of, by the authority of Jesus Christ. That's an important piece of information to have. But I keep gathering information out of the Bible. And I find in the New Testament that the Lord's Church in the New Testament worshipped on the first day of the week. That's when God instructed His church to come together in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. That is when the Lord's Church was coming together. In Acts 20 and verse 7, it was happening on the first day of the week. That's an important piece of information to have. I'm, I'm going to put that in my bowl. I'm just gathering information. I'm putting it in my bowl to find out what does the Bible have to say about worship. First Timothy chapter 2, verses uh, 8 and 9 and following, the Bible says that male members of the church were to be those who were leading the church in its worship. And so I, I find that piece of information, and, and I say, well, I'm going to put that in my bowl. The Bible says when it comes to worship, 
that there are various avenues that are involved in our worship. That we're to worship through preaching. That the preaching of the Word of God is to be a part of worship in, in, in the New Testament church. So I'm going to put that in my bowl and make sure that when, I, when I'm looking for preaching, that it's going to have worship as a part of it. We find that our worship is to have giving. That's one of the avenues by which we worship God, is that we give to Him. And, and, and Lawrence did a great job of reading 2 Corinthians chapter 9 this morning, verses 6 through 8, where we're given those instructions as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So I, I'm going to put that in my bowl too. The Bible also says, and this wouldn't surprise us, that praying is to be a part of our worship, that we're to pray to God. We're to petition Him as a body of people that we pray together. As his, so I, I find that piece of information in the Bible. So I'm going to put that in my bowl so that I don't forget it. The Bible also says that partaking of the Lord's Supper is to be a part of that first day of the week worship. That when the church came together, Acts 20, verse 7, that, that, that on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. An expression in the New Testament that means to take the Lord's Supper. And so I learn when I come to the New Testament that they did that on the first day of the week. And how, 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 many, how many weeks have a first day? Have you ever had a week that didn't have a first day? You've had a week that's been full of Mondays, but Monday's not the first day of the week. Have you ever had a week that didn't have a first day? Every week you've ever lived had a first day. And so when we're told to gather on the first day of the week and to partake of the Lord's Supper, how often should we be partaking of the Lord's Supper? That'd be every first day of the week when we gather together. I see that's what God wanted from His church. And I say, well, I'm going to put that in my bowl. I learned that those elements that, that, that are involved in that worship were, were the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. I said, I'm going I'm to put that in my bowl. I, I, I learned that, that God wants all Christians to partake of all of the elements, not just some. So I, I see Jesus say that when He, when he uh, institutes the Lord's Supper. That's an important information to have. I see that the Lord's Supper is to be a memorial where I discern, I think about Jesus' body as I'm partaking, and I put all of those verses in my bowl. When it comes to worship, I learn that there is to be congregational singing that's in our worship. Ephesians 5, verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. When we come together to worship, God wants us to sing. When we come together to worship, God wants us to sing to one another. When we come together to worship, God wants all of us to sing to all of us from our hearts with our mouths. And I read Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, Hebrews 13, 15, and a number of verses in the New Testament. I learned that's what God wants in His worship. So I, all I've been doing at this point is I've just been gathering. I've been out in the fields of God's Word, and I'm just bringing it in. I'm gathering it all together. I'm just putting it in my bowl. And now that I've got it in my bowl, what, what do I do? Once I've gathered all of this information together, what do I do? I have to handle it accurately. Not, not just gather it together and say, oh, well, that doesn't really matter. Or gather it together and handle it any old way that I want to. I've got to handle it accurately. What does that involve? It involves the same things we've been talking about. How do I handle accurately what the Bible says about worship? I only draw conclusions based upon what the evidence says. I don't draw conclusions based upon what somebody else says because that's not the evidence. I don't base, draw conclusions based upon what church tradition is because that's not the evidence. I don't draw conclusions based upon my feelings because that's not the evidence. I look in my bowl and what's in my bowl? I need to let the bowl, I need to let God's word explain itself. I need to not say, God, here's what I want to do in worship, and so I'm going to come to your word and find it so that I can prove that, that no, 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 that's backwards. I come to God's word and I say, what does God, the audience of worship, want from me? And I gather all that together and I say, oh, this is what God wants from me. I follow his directions. I go in the, in, 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 in the proper order that God would have me to go, and I don't change it. I don't add to it, Revelation 22, verse 18. I don't take away from it, Revelation 22, verse 19. I don't, I don't substitute it. I don't do something different just for the sake of being different. Why? Because whatever's in the bowl is what God wants. And I keep all of this in the proper context and determine what is it. What is the one meaning that God has? What is the one intent that God has? What is the one outcome that God wants for my worship? You see, if I change 
worship. If I just change one thing about what God says about, if I just, just, there's a lot in here, right? If I just change one thing about it, guess what? Now it's my worship, not God's worship. If I change one thing about the organization of the church, guess what? That's not God's church anymore. Now it's my church. I just changed one thing, but now it's my church because I changed one thing. If I change one thing about worship, now it's not God's worship. Now it's, now it's my worship. And now I can do whatever I want because it's all about what I want. But if I want to be concerned about what God wants and follow His standard, I've got to gather the information and then handle it the way God says to handle it, not adding to and not taking away from it. So when I gather this all together, you know what I don't find in the bowl? I don't find in the bowl partaking of the Lord's Supper, say, once a month. It's, it's, it's just not in the bowl. I, I, it's not in the evidence that God gave. I don't find partaking of the Lord's Supper on Saturday. I don't find worshiping. Come, gathering together and partaking of the Lord's Supper on Saturday? It's, it, it's, it's not here. I cannot speak where God's Word does not speak. I, can, I, I cannot teach something that God's Word does not teach. I, I, I don't find... I don't find women leading in worship in the bowl of information. You know what I don't find here? I don't find a single solitary shred of information that tells me that I have a right to have an instrument of music in my worship. So he says, well, what's the big deal about an instrument of, worship, of music? You know, that's just, that's just helping us. That's just helping us in our worship. It's, it's, not, it's not really altering it that much. Can I go back and ask you, what's the big deal about putting this in our chocolate chip cookies? What's the big deal about using this as our measuring cup? What's the big deal about using this as our baking soda? All of a sudden, we're not following the recipe. Oh, but I like it this way. You can like it this way, but when you're done, you need to recognize it's not God's worship anymore. It's what you want. It's the changes that you have made to it. And when I come here, God says to sing. You know, when the recipe says, when the recipe says put in semi-sweet chocolate chip morsels, did you see anywhere in the recipe? I, I put it up there for you to see. It's in big, bold print, right? I mean, you could read it clear as day, right? When it says put in these chips, did you see anywhere in the recipe that said do not put in peanut butter chips. Did the recipe say that? Did you, the, didn't say it, did it? Did it have to say it? When the recipe said, we're making the world's best chocolate chip cookies. And when you get down to that part of the recipe where it says, put in semi-sweet morsel chocolate chips. It doesn't have to say what not to put in. Because it told me what to put in. And if it had to tell me everything not to put into that recipe, wow, you'd be in the kitchen a while reading that list of stuff not to put in. But when it specifies what to put in, it automatically excludes every other chip. When God specifies the music that he wants in worship, he didn't have to say, I don't want this other kind of music, because by specifying singing, God automatically excluded every other kind of music. Why? Because the evidence does not support it. It's not there. As we close this morning, I want you to think about, does the Bible have anything to say about God's plan of salvation? If I were to do the same thing with the plan of salvation, what would I do? I would have to gather all of the relevant information. I would have to learn very briefly that sin is a personal choice. It's not something I inherit. It's a choice that I make to violate the will of God. Sin, therefore, is a personal choice. Separates me from God. Doesn't separate somebody else from God because I've sinned. Separates me from God because I am the one who has sinned. Therefore, salvation is my greatest need. Sin is my personal choice. Sin separates me from God. Guess what I need more than anything else? I need to be saved from my sins. That's the need of every man and woman on this earth, is to be saved from their sins. The good thing, the great thing about that is that salvation is available for all. What if everybody needed salvation, but only a few could be saved? 
There's religions out there that say, well, everybody needs salvation, but God only predestined a certain number to be saved, and if you weren't one of them, too bad. The Bible, the information that I gather together says, God has extended His grace to all men, Titus 2 and verse 1. doesn't mean that all men are saved, but it says that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. It's there for everybody. It's, it's not limited in that regard, but salvation requires a personal response. If I, want, if I need to be saved, I do. If I want to be saved, I should. I've got to do something. It requires me to personally respond, which means... I'm not going to be saved by a direct act of God that I don't want. There's religions out there that teach the irresistible grace of God. That God's going to save you whether you want to be saved or not. That's not in the, the Bible says that we're saved and it requires a personal choice on our part. The Bible says that it requires obeying God's will. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, to all who obey him. I have to do not what I think is right. I've got to do what Jesus says. I've got to do the will of my Father in heaven in order to go to heaven, Matthew 7 and verse 21 says. And wouldn't you know it, that the same thing that's required of me is required of you is required of everybody. Salvation from sin calls for the same response calls for the same requirements of everybody. It's not, well, this church can do it this way, and this church can do it this way, and this church can do it this way, and as long as they're all, you know, kind of in the same neighborhood. It, 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 wait a minute. In the Bible, those who were saved were called to do the same thing every time. Not something different. Not something that fit a certain culture. Same requirements for everybody everywhere. That's just a piece of information that I find in, in Acts 20, or not Acts 20, in Acts 10, verse 34, Peter says, I, I, in truth I perceive God is no respecter of persons. Verse 35, he says, but everywhere, no matter where it is, God's no respecter of persons, but whoever believes in him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So wherever that is, those who follow God's same requirements can have the same results. Well, what are those requirements? In order to be saved, God requires faith in Jesus. I've got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God in order to be saved. And all I'm doing right now is just gathering my information together. I'm just trying to get in the Bible, say, what does the Bible say? Well, that's not all the Bible says. The Bible says the salvation requires me to repent from my sins, to make up my mind. I want to stop doing wrong and start doing right. I've got to make that decision in order to be saved. The Bible says that I've got to confess my faith in Jesus. And I'm not mentioning a lot of verses, but you see them on the screen. They're here. We don't have time to, to go through all of them. But the Bible says I need to confess my faith in Jesus. That I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Is that all? If, 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 if I've got all of that information in my bowl, have I gathered, have I gathered, have I gathered all the relevant information? Did you know that the Bible says that I must be immersed into Christ, that I must be baptized in order to be saved? I mean, I'm gathering all of these things together, and, and, and I find that Jesus says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. I've got to put that in my bowl. I find Peter says in Acts 2, verse 38, Repent, let everyone be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. I've got to put that in my bowl. I see that Ananias said to Saul, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. I've got to put that in my bowl. I see 1 Peter 3, verse 21, baptism does also now save us. I've got to put that in my bowl. I'm gathering all the ingredients, all the information, all the instructions. And I gather it all here. The Bible says if I want to be saved after I'm baptized, I need to continue to live a faithful life to Him. Be faithful unto death, and you'll receive the crown of life, Revelation 2 and verse 10. And I go through the Bible, and I gather all of this information together. And I gather all the relevant information, the things that have to do with my salvation. And I say, what does the Bible say? I need to handle this accurately. Rightly dividing the word of truth, the New King James, Old King James says in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Handling it the way that God intended it for it to be handled with these same points that we've been making. 
I can only draw conclusions about salvation based upon what does the information say. And I need to let the information teach me, not say, here's what I think we need to do to be saved, and I'm going to come to the Bible to find a verse that proves what I think we need to do. That's backwards. I don't decide what, I, the evidence, the instruction decides what I need to do to be saved, and then I let the Bible speak for itself. I let it teach me what I need to do. I follow the instructions, and I go in the order that they are given. I don't change the order. I don't change the, what the requirements say. Well, I'm going I'm to I'm put salvation over here. I'm going to put baptism over here. I'm going to put this over here. I don't change the I, I go in the order that God has given in his word. And when I do that, I do not add to it. I do not take away from it. I don't change it. And I keep everything within the context that God has determined for it to have. And I say, what's the one meaning? What's the one goal? What's the one purpose? What's the one aim that God has in salvation? I've got to answer these questions in order to answer it, in, in order to handle it accurately. Do you know what I don't find when I look in this bowl? I don't find infant baptism. When I, when I look in this bowl of information from the Bible, I don't find infant baptism. I, I, I don't find sprinkling or pouring as, as a mode of, of baptism. It, it, it's just not there. I, I don't find... That, that babies are born in sin and, and need, and need, that, and need that, that sprinkling on them. I don't find the unconditional election. I don't find limited atonement. I don't find irresistible grace. I don't find once saved, always saved. I don't find being saved before baptism, that you're saved and then you're baptized after that. that that's not the order. That, that I, if I just look in the bowl, if I just look at all the information I gathered, salvation is always after baptism. It's never before it, and it's never without it. Salvation always came at the point of baptism. And when, when I look in this bowl, and boy, I, I look and I look and I, boy, I've gathered a lot of gathered, and I look everywhere I can and all the information, you know what I don't see? I don't see the sinner's prayer in here. I've gathered everything the Bible says about salvation, but I don't see the sinner's prayer because it's not here. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to interpret the Bible the way God intended it to be interpreted, and I'm just using common sense. The same common sense that it would take me to make some chocolate chip cookies is the same common sense I use to understand the Bible. Don't let somebody tell you the Bible is too hard to understand. You can't understand it the way God intended it to be understood. Don't let somebody tell you that. That's a lie. God gave you the Bible, and God gave you a brain. Do you think he could make the two work together? Thank God that he hasn't left us without the information and the instructions that we need in order to go to heaven. I know this is a lot of information today. I know this is a lot to take in. But if we'll do this same thing with every Bible topic that we study, and just use common sense. We can understand the Bible the way God intended it to be understood. Are you a Christian today? Are, are, are you a Christian according to the evidence that the Bible lays out? According to what God says, have you followed his plan? Bob, can you just put slide 15 back up? Have you followed God's plan in God's order? Have you ever been baptized for the remission of your sins? Are you living today as a faithful Christian? If the answer to either of those questions is no, we encourage you to respond this morning and get your life right with God right now as together we stand and sing.